Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Stanislav Boletsky. Stanislav is a lecturer at the Department of Foreign Languages and Literature, University of Dodoma, Tanzania. He lectures on field linguistics and lexicography and conducts research on Hyanzu and Gogo languages. His interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and lingua botany and ecological knowledge encapsulated in them. Please join me in welcoming Stanislav as he gives his talk, an overview of verbal morphology of Ihanzu. Thank you. Good evening, dear colleagues. This is not the first time we meet online uh, in, in the framework of these webinars. I think this is my third talk in the last two years of being a member of this network. I'm happy to share with you some of my uh, observations of this small Bantu language or a dialect of a bigger Bantu language. This is a disputable question. Um, so currently I'm outside of Tanzania and I'm waiting for the reply from the University of Dodoma to, to my request to renew the contract. But meanwhile, I'm, uh, I still continue working with the data I collected during my stay in Tanzania at the University of Dodoma. This is like lasting affiliation with that university. Uh, Isanzo or Ihanzo, Kinyi Sanzo, Kinyi Sanzo uh, is a language spoken in Tanzania in Singida region in Iramba district. And to the best of my knowledge, like the capital of Uisanzo is a village called Ihanzo. It is located in Singida region. And uh, what my consult consultants told me, so the best speakers, the best native speakers, the most qualified native speakers are found in this village. However, I was not able to travel to that village. I conducted my field research uh, at the 4CCP Cultural Center in Haidum. Haidum is a small town in Singida. Uh, and there is a wonderful place, a wonderful museum called 4CCP, 4 Cultural, 4, 4, Cor 4 Corner Cultural Center. Uh, and the, uh, the administration of 4CCP is welcoming researchers and they facilitate uh, the field work so they can call, they can select and call and invite um, competent native speakers from those villages and they provide working space. So this field work was very comfortable, relaxing, and I would say I was happy and had a privilege to feel comfortable during the field work because unlike many, went to the real field and who remember how tough and you know challenging it was I, I cannot say it was challenging it was comfortable anyway so back to the language uh, according to different sources of information there are 26 to 34,000 people speaking this language uh, so this small number of native speakers lowers the vitality index of Isanzu to 6a according to the ethnologs so it is a threatened language, uh, mainly because of the number of speakers. Intergenerational transmission is not broken. Children acquire the language, uh, but there are not so many. When we try to classify this language, so we find different approaches uh, in the ethnologue, Isanzu is considered to be a language on its own, taking into consideration the opinion of the speaker. So they believe they speak a separate language. According to Maho, it's a dialect. It's a dialect of uh, Nilamba. In some other resources, I found another classification. So Isanzu is considered to be a dialect of Nyaturu. So it's more close to Nyaturu according to the morphology and phonetics. Um, so anyway, this is a variety of language that lacks documentation, that lacks, it, it is under-documented language or dialect. 
I think this is a, a, a reason to, to continue with it. And because uh, I've heard some critics that, okay, you, you are studying something that might be known already. If yes, then I will prove it. If no, then we'll find some new features adding a little bit to, to the theory of Bantu languages. So there are very few materials, very few publications about this language. So one of them is a list of core and cultural vocabulary in the PhD thesis of Marcele. So this list contains one and a half thousand items that was a starting point for my research. So there is a publication that I published together with my colleague from the University of Dodoma. 2019, it's a brief overview of, of phonetics and morphology of this language. Of course, Andrew Harvey is documenting this language and uploading the data into the archive. And there is um, a short piece of like a brief sociological, sociolinguistic survey on this language done by the linguist from the Summer Institute of Linguistics, 1996. I've heard there is a newer version, like dated 2000 and something, but I was not able to find it. So the one I have dates back to 1996. So, and it states that the intergenerational transmission is not broken, so it's quite safe. Um, so the framework, why I decided to work on this language. Um, while being lecturer at the University of Dodoma, I decided to, to be involved uh, into Bantu studies. So originally I come from Germanic languages, but staying for eight years in Tanzania, you know, obliged me uh, to gain additional qualification in Bantu linguistics. And so we, we, with time, I created my own project, which was supported by Endangered Language Fund. So was called Structural Description and Documentation of a Threatened Tanzanian Language Isanzo. And so I went to Haidom three times. So on this slide, I forgot to add the third research day, which I did the last year. So I published um, an article. I had several talks at conferences about this language. Um, and the current piece of research is guided by the questions, what morphemes constitute verbal phrases in Ihanzo? How are they arranged? What is their semantics? So data for this, the data which I use to answer these questions comes from translational elicitation based on the uh, Batibos questionnaire on morphosyntaxis of Bantu languages that contains about 250 sentences which are supposed to be translated from Swahili into the language under research and a text collection. So the, this text collection includes 10 traditional narratives, fairy tales about animals. And of course I used uh, Shoebox or Field Explorer, so now it's called Field Explorer software of the Summer Institute of Linguistics uh, to do morphological and semantic analysis of this data. Um, this is the theoretical framework, it's quite simple. This is a schematic representation of a Bantu verbal phrase. Finite verb, infinitive and imperative. Uh, so we have three main schemes here. Uh, so I, I would focus on the first one, on the first line in this representation, uh, finite phrase. So if we consider the root to be the main part of the verbal phrase, and if we go left to the root, we have several uh, slots. If we go to the right from that root, we have some other slots and we number them, at least in this tradition where I belong now, the Russian tradition of Bantu studies, but I think it's similar. Like the, the structure is the same, whatever labels you use to describe it. Uh, so the first slot is called pre-prefix. Uh, it can contain uh, morphemes that show negation, contrast or focus, 
a relative marker and tense aspect mood marker. The next slot is prefix. Um, so here we can find subject marker, habitual form of the subject marker, relative marker, and a fused morpheme that has double meaning negations and subject mark like a negative form of the subject mark. The next slot is in infix one. So here we can find negation again. Uh, infix two is reserved for tense aspect mood mark. Infix three is reserved for relative uh, morpheme. Infix four is reserved for object marker and reflexive. Uh, to the right of the root, uh, the first component to find are derivational suffixes. So in English speaking literature, they're called extensions. So these extensions include passive, applicative, causative, uh, medio passive, reciprocal. The list might be longer, actually depending on the particular language. The next slot is pre-final position. So here we can find only one morpheme ag, uh, which can be interpreted in a number of ways. In some languages, this is habitual. In, in other languages, like in Sanzo, this is iterative. Uh, and in some other languages, it can be considered to be associative. The next slot is final position. Here we find the final vowel and perfective morpheme. And the very last slot is post final slot. It is reserved for relative morpheme, for locative markers, and for clitics. So this is a general theoretical framework, and I use it to I just apply this scheme to my data to see what I find. It's like fishing, you know. <laughs> you, you put that like uh, how do you call it angle yeah? in in German, and you see what you catch. So what I have caught in this scheme. So uh, pre-prefix, the first slot, pre-verbal complex that can consist of relative morpheme of negation and tense. Um, so relative particle in Sanzo is ni, which can be translated into English with who, which, that, when, while. It can be followed by a negation, by tense aspect mood, marked by noun or by an adjective. So these are the structures I was able to find in my data. Uh, let's consider some examples. So negative particle, singa, shanga, or sha. These are three variants of the negation. So it corresponds in Swahili to C. Um, there is also one a lexical item that is used to negate the comment, the optative form of the verb, leka. So in Swahili, it corresponds to acha. And an example here, one and yama shanga nilian embei. I don't eat raw meat. So um, this is a direct speech of a rabbit, a hare, uh, who was caught by the farmer. And the farmer wanted to, oh no, sorry. Uh, the, 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 the hair was caught by the elephants uh, whose grandmother died because of his activities. So the elephants wanted to punish him while feeding the corpse of that baby elephant to him. So he tries to avoid this punishment while saying that he doesn't eat uh, raw meat. So here, here we can see the structure negative plus relative particle plus adjective. Shanga, Inyama, Nimbei. So the other example, tense aspect mood mark, which can be found in the pre-prefix slot. So, um, so far I could, um, I was able to find two morphemes, Ali and Adza. So I call them discontinuous past. Um, discontinuous past is, somehow equal to plus quant perfect in European languages. Of course, there is no direct correspondence here, but I, I would call it like a plus quant perfect because these two morphemes uh, set temporal framework of the scene. 
So they show that something that will happen next happened in the remote past that has no connection to the present moment, unlike the past tense are. This morpheme is widespread in Bantu languages. And in Isanzu, this is just recent or remote past that can be linked to the present moment. But this Ali or I is something that happened long time ago and is no more valid in the present moment. So Ali can be used as a copula, existential copula in the past. Monyangala Nenzogo Ai Kuhumba Shuya. So hare and elephants were friends long time ago. And uh, So elephant and hare, elephants and hare used to eat vegetables from farmers' fields. So it happened in the past. So it does not happen anymore in the present moment. So this is the idea of this very short word I. So it introduces something that is not valid anymore. And the structure uh, that we can see in the last example is pre-prefix plus root plus final vowel. So this is the bare infinitive um, that is following the, the copula. So we move to the next slot. This is prefix and it corresponds in the form and the shape to infix four which is reserved for object markers. So we can say they are actually the same, subject marker and object marker, with some uh, small phonological um, changes. Um, so the system of subject markers in Ihanzo um, is typical for Bantu languages. And there are several approaches to how to classify them. Uh, I would use this, um, and double classification, considering the category of person. Um, so personal markers include classes one and two. So I, I create this uh, general classification where I include personal pronouns and the noun classes like into one chart. And then the personal pronouns are manifestations of this category of person and classes one and two also form a part of the personal subsystem of this language. Um, so far, I was not able to find uh, any example of double marking of the object marker. So there is only one object marker, if there is. And some examples, Panakasuka, Myangala, Wakamuhanga, after coming back, he found him, the field's owner, the farmer. So we can see the object marking here, mu, which corresponds to the noun class number one, but at the same time, this is third person singular. I prefer to label it with third person singular. So as long as I distinguish personal markers and non-personal markers. Another example, leka kombolago nene. So this is what the hair says to the farmer, don't kill me. So this m uh, is actually the phonetical realization of homo organic n. So it should be n as a class, as a um, marker of the first person singular, but because of the next, Bilabial sound ba, so it's pronounced like ma, it's realized like ma on the surface level. The, the other example, mpe omolime, give me work. So the hair is asking the farmer to employ him uh, to protect the field from the elephants. Uh, this is optative form, so we can see it on the last, on the final vowel. And again, it starts with the object marker, first person singular. Again, this should be n, ni, but because of the following consonant, it mutates to ma. The next slot, infix two. Uh, so it should be analyzed together with the final slot, uh, because 
it involves combination of morphemes. Uh, so the first combination, tense aspect mood marker one, plus tense aspect mood marker two, uh, final position. So the first slot is empty. The second slot is occupied by ile ire morpheme, which is a usual tool, usual device for perfective in Bantu languages. An example here, Nyangala nae wendile, mongwan suwakahanga in haranga. So one day he went there on his own to find peanuts. It was a field uh, where he was caught by the farmer. So the verb here um, shows the empty TAM one slot. The second slot is occupied by Ile. So this is perfective. And the idea of perfective is to connect the past with the present moment. Although it is a narrative, it is a fairy tale, but the listener is already in the fairy tale. That's how the connection is created to this perfective Ile. So we are living the moment together with these characters. We are in the story and it is the present moment for, for, for us as listeners. And it is a triggering event. So this perspective is used to introduce triggering events. So the other morphine which is used in this uh, slot is ku, uh, which can be marked as present or continuous, but Present tense is, is not the right expression. There are languages where present tense is, does not exist as such, yes? Um, so I think Isandu is one of those languages where it's very difficult to say that something is a marker of present tense. So ku, sometimes ku can be considered as a representation of the present tense, but more generally it is a continuous form, something like ki in Swahili. Ekandi and Kanga, Ketanga on Wenga, Eki Imba. Kanga started calling wind, singing a song. So uh, this is a sentence from a fairy tale about Kanga, Guinea Fool, and uh, Dove, um, how they try to ruin nests of each other. And Kanga, Guinea Fool, was doing it while calling the wind to come and to blow away the nest of the dove. So, and we can see this continuous form here, iki imba, like singing. She was doing it while singing. So there is no start, there is no end of this action. The focus is on the action itself, iki imba. Then there is past tense a, past tense. So this is a, something that happened outside of the chronology if we consider the data of the narrative texts. So narratives are organized in the chronological way. That's why they have a lot of ka forms and of the narrative past forms. If narrator needs to explain something that happened outside of the chronology, so he or she is using this a past. And in, in general, uh, in other data, uh, non-narrative data, uh, this is um, a frequent expression of the past. Recent past, remote past. So something that is that can be linked to the present, but not necessarily should. Uh, so the next morpheme is Ika or Aka. These are uh, allomorphs of the narrative past. Endongo, Yakedza, Yakalemela, Etanga. Elephants came and ate pumpkins. Um, so these forms, Ake, Aka, um, express the idea of events happening one after another in a chronological way. And in narrative, this is the most frequent past form. Uh, another morpheme, O, is future tense. Uh, Yokutala, it will be necessary to do that and that. So we move to the next slot um, infix form, uh, derivational suffixes, and pre final slot. Uh, in infix four, we find only one morpheme key, 
uh, which to the best of my knowledge has only one, meaning it is reflexive. Nyangala wa kipiria wikienda mumogondo wa monto nuanso. Then he ran and came to the farmer's field. Uh, so this form wa kipiria uh, is andative. So this is a um, verb of motion that has a direction from the starting point, from the place where the hair was, he ran away to another direction. And this reflexive, um, reflexive morpheme um, is used as a, as a direction. It is used to make the verb take in the form of andative. Uh, another example, akigom, uh, akigom, akigombia, they agreed. This is reciprocal. So this key morpheme functions as reciprocal form. So if we remove it, akombia, it will be like he agreed, but if we insert key, so they agreed with each other. They did something mutually. So this is the main idea of reflexive. So another slot in this scheme are derivational suffixes or extensions. Uh, so what I can find, what I could find in my data are applicatives with E, passive with W, causatives with Z, medial passive with ek, ik, and habituals and, and iteratives with ag. And some examples here, examples of applicative. Shanga nilia. So this y, which is written with y, is applicative form. So it introduces a direct object. I don't eat meat. So if this hair would have said that he doesn't eat at all, applicative would not have been used. Uh, the example of passive, we come um, So the hair was caught by the field's owner. So this W introduces the uh, passive voice. Uh, for some strange reasons, I don't have examples of causative and medial passive, but they are. In my data, I, I was able to find them. And pre-final slot contains morpheme ag, which has semantics of habitual, action or iterative action. Leka kombolago nen, so already known example. So this form kombolaga uh, is actually iterative. This ag is not habitual, like in, in, in colloquial Swahili, it is iterative here. The idea of killing someone is the idea of hitting and hitting and hitting until someone dies. So this durative actions. Uh, this is a general overview of the morphemes, uh, of the surface realization of the morphemes in Ihanzo, those which I was able to identify in my data. I don't label here, here uh, them with grammatical categories because it's, um, you know, an, a, a PhD is not enough to answer the question, what are the morphemes? verbal morphemes in, in this language and what are the semantics. But I, I just wanted to give an, an overview of what, what can be found in this language. And then I can see we have some more minutes, I think like 10 minutes. I would love to continue uh, with another approach, uh, which I use to analyze the behavior of these morphemes in narratives because they behave a, bit, a little bit different uh, in narrative than in the questionnaires. And I used theory of narrative, of uh, oral narrative, uh, starting with the topical structure of a narrative. So there are three parts in every well-built story, old equilibrium, collapse of the old equilibrium, and new equilibrium. And we will see they are marked grammatically with different tenses, with different, with different morphemes. And if we take a closer look 
uh, to this uh, three component scheme, it can be it can it can be expanded into six slots: abstract, then orientation, then complicated action, then resolution, then coda. So we can see old equilibrium consists of abstract, like the announcement of the story and the orientation. So this is the phase where the listeners are, uh, are invited into the narrative reality. So main characters are introduced, the time and place is introduced. Then collapse uh, is, so collapse starts with triggering events, the complicating action stage. So something unusual happens in the old equilibrium that leads to its collapse. And collapse itself is the most reportable event. This is where the previous structure breaks down. And then new equilibrium is described as resolution, how the new equilibrium is, and how the problem or conflict has been resolved. And then coda, this is the moment where we come back into the reality from the narrative world. And evaluation is an, is an optional component of this structure. So all of these structures can be analyzed through grammar. They all can be analyzed through morphology. And uh, in the remaining slides, uh, I, I would try to show uh, how morphology corresponds to these components of narrative structure. So we have old equilibrium collapse and new equilibrium. So old equilibrium is harmonious lifestyle friendship based on circular passage of time. Future is the repetition of the past. So elephants and hare were friends. So they together used to eat pumpkins while coming to the field of the farm. This is old equilibrium, collapse, harmony gets broken, unexpected event with enormous consequences happens. So the harmony starts getting broken when the hare decides to go to the field on his own without his friends, the elephants. And he is caught by the farmer, so the collapse of the equilibrium. So new equilibrium, the world we know, disharmonious with death, betrayal, etc. So and the new equilibrium contains etiology in the imcoda. So why snake has no legs, or why like, other animals have no eyes, and so on. It's an explanation of the things we know. So this is the reason why. Kanga is nesting at the, uh, during the dry season. If you look at the morphology, at the verb, at the verbal form, so we, we can see that the, um, that the old equilibrium is marked with discontinuous past, uh, collapse or triggering event is marked with perfective and the consecutive past or narrative past, and new equilibrium is marked with habitual form. So this is, uh, habitual form is not like in Swahili Ag. Uh, habitual form in Sanzo is uh, uh, zero marking in TAM1 slot and the final vowel R. So this is habitual. Uh, let me jump to the conclusions. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of examples here. Um, so if, if we try to see the correspondence between the verbal morphemes, the elements of the verbal structure and the narrative structure, we should say that uh, orientation is marked with I discontinuous past with zero R form, which is habitual form, but in the past, past habitual, with key form, which is continuous form, but it all happens in the past, in the remote past. 
triggering event is marked by perfective or uh, narrative past. Ile aka. Complicating action is marked by narrative past only, aka and ika. So these are allomorphs. Uh, information, like evaluation. Information is a case of evaluation. So information is inserted with perfective, with habitual, with continuous, then with past tense, which is marked here, uh, uh, with future, general future, discontinued future, add the or, or, and with uh, optative a. Uh, climax, the most, uh, the most reportable event is marked by k, by the narrative past. Uh, resolution is marked by i, perfective, and narrative past k, and coda is using k and a past tenses. So this is the correspondence which I was able to establish through my data. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. We can now begin the question and answer section. The question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written questions. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question that is also still possible, you can do so using the Zoom chat module, and as usual, I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. I will start with my own question to give other participants time to write or to look for the raise hand button. So I was wondering that con conclusion slide that you are on, I was wondering what you sort of conclude about these patterns, like what, what do you think is meaningful about the patterns that you see here? So these are narrative functions of the morphemes, because when we try to establish the semantics in isolation, like what is the semantics of R? Yes, general semantics is past, but we know that these are discontextualized examples and semantics, like data I got from the questioners, from Batibo questioner. Uh, it's great, it provides a general overview of semantics of morphology, but in narratives, in authentic text, it behaves in a different way, in a more complicated way, because I, I think considering one item in isolation from the context, it's not, it, it shows a limited picture because verbs are like the poly, predicates are polypredicative, so to say. Can I ask a quick follow up to that? Did you find that most of the tense aspect marking that you found in the questionnaires also occurred in stories or were there some tense aspect markers that you didn't see occurring in stories? All of them. I find all of them in stories. If you cross out the direct speech, then you will find a limited number of them. But as long as you have direct speech and in stories and well elaborated stories, uh, there is always direct speech. So it shows the full range of uh, verb morphology. Marta? Uh, yes, uh, uh, a, a very interesting presentation, very interesting language. I'm happy to hear about it. And um, I have, have, have many questions. But um, so, what is most on my mind? Maybe the reflexive, uh, where we have, okay, reflexive reciprocal. To use the reflexive or reciprocal, I think that's common in, in, in that group of languages. But I wonder whether this undative, um, whether that may be a separate uh, marker uh, in maybe even a separate slot where you, you can have uh, directional markers in, in, in Bantu languages. Um, I hesitate to, to, to see that as an extension of the reflexive meaning. So I wonder what you, what you think about that. Yes, it was also, I was not sure in classifying this morpheme as something that makes undative out of the verb. I, I couldn't see any other um, explicit device 
uh, could function in this way. But based the on the... Ka, uh, the ka and the tif in, in many Bantu languages, in, but maybe then in, in another, in an earlier in, in fixed uh, slot. So I analyzed ka in this case as a narrative path because this is not the first event, this is the continuation. Yeah, this yeah, is like yeah. next predicate of separate the main case. Separate yes. case, yeah, different one, yeah. So um, from typological perspective, it's not usual. May I go on, Martha, until, until you see another hand. No? <laughs> Please interrupt me if anybody has a question. I, I was interested in those, uh, those clitics, those separate words that you have, and then you have a verb from following. I found it very interesting because I, if, I, if I recall, after the Ali, the, that copula, you get the bare infinitive. But after the negative one, leka, you get the, the ku infinitive. And after the, sh the negative shunga, you get an inflected verb form. So do you have any, any, any suggestions of the uh, etymological origin of these negative uh, clitics, leka and shunga? Are they verbs? Are they negative verbs that are similar to that? No, these are enigmatic to me. The only thing I notice it functions in a similar way. This leka functions in a similar way as acha in Swahili. And hmm. in, in Gogo, there is an item that functions in the same way in Chicago. And, and do you like, know whether you can use it as a verb? So the, it, it seems it has, it used to have meaning as living something, live it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, you uh, there's no tone in the Ihanzu? There is. <laughs> Sorry. But I don't mark it. And, I know. So you get <laughs> no, away I with should it? have. <laughs> Do you really have the feeling that you can get away with it? Because especially in the tense aspect system, uh, for many Bantu languages, you get fine distinctions. So, no, I, I, I don't want to attack you on not marking tone because you know you have to. But um, I'm very curious to, because I'm sure you have an intuition whether the whether the when you whether you hear tonal differences between these inflected verb forms. I decided to analyze the segmental structure first. Then when I was when I would be clear about the segmental representation, then I would go into more fine analysis. But, more but do you analysis. do you hear different tonal patterns when you listen to these verbal forms? Or are they all the same? Do they all sound the same? Is the, mm. Does it sound like stress or does it sound like tone? It sounds like tone, but I cannot figure out any pattern. So you hear differences, but you still have to analyze them. Yes. There's a note from Helen in the chat, um, thanking for your, you for your talk and also saying, it seems there was an SIL survey in 2015. I will try to hunt down the report and send it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There, there were, I was very, sorry. <laughs> I, I, can, can I still go on there? No one else has raised their hand or put a question in the chat. So oh, as long as they know that they can interrupt, I think it's fine. Any moment, please. I would be very happy. But uh, um, here we have, yes, we exactly at this slide. Thank you. How did you know? Uh, I am very interested. To, I didn't manage to pass that sentence of the guinea fowl. Guinea fowl started calling wind singing because many of these uh, uh, sentences, you have some glossing, but not for this one. Can you explain this? Can you explain the sentence in, in, in the Ihanzu sentence to me? Uh -huh. Ikanja, this is the verb. So she started in Kanga, Kanga, the Guinea fall, Kitanga, Kuita, like in Swahili, to call Unguega, the wind, Ikimba, while singing. So started Kanga calling wind while singing. That would be the direct translation. Thank you. And the first word, uh, how is that then? That is a verb then. Uh, how is that then yes. uh, split up? The e this is impersonal. Word. Yes, it's impersonal form with uh, nine, the, the class nine, E, Kandia. Then Ka. And then the Ka for the, what, for the narrative? Or? For the narrative, yes. So she came, uh, it came, it, 
it came she's okay so if you have these these um, that that the subject comes after the verb do you always get then impersonal on the on the verb is that the construction no well, this is a stylistic uh, like a stylistic feature okay. to dramatize the action yeah. so it breaks the like the, 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 the normal scheme it breaks the expected uh, word order creates yeah. in this like dramatic effect but if and the then would... and then and then yeah. it becomes this meaning so it would be the same ikanja if you had the um, yangala there instead of the ikanga uh, yes so is the usage of that almost not verbal that it's just sort of and then the next thing that happened or is it very much like an action started uh, this is a continuation this is a polyverbal predicate actually analytically we can say like this is one verb this is another verb this is a third verb but in the narrative there is a starting point and then the like a chain of sequence a chain of actions and they are poly predicates so this is a part of this chain we do still have a few minutes if you want to go back to any of the slides that you had skipped over uh, yes maybe to illustrate the difference between the, the different parts of the narrative so triggering events uh, this is the beginning of complicating action and they are marked by narrative or consecutive clauses with this ka different alamors of ka monyangalanai wendiri monguanso wakahangen haranga so here the triggering event is marked by perfective so in another story so here we have ka form. One day the lion went to find meat and the cow, and, and he left, and she left the lioness, the children with the cow. So the cow and the lion were friends at that time, the remote past. And there is a difference, grammatical difference between the same action. So in 3b, we can see a triggering event marked with ka. And in 2b, we can see exactly the same action which happened in the old equilibrium. In Gombe, Aile, Kelva, Yana, Kiginsa, Palumbe, Koke, Sokela. So the line left the children with the cow. So the action is the same, but the grim is different because this action happens at different points of the narrative structure. 2B happens in the old equilibrium, in the orientation phase, and it is marked with discontinuous past I. But the action happening in 3B is a triggering event, and it is marked with the uh, narrative past. I don't know if this is something you've had the opportunity to look into or not, um, but I was wondering what the sort of, how the distribution of possible tense aspect combinations that you see in Ihanzu is similar or different to other languages that are maybe closely related? I, I could say it's different from that pattern that I observed in Chigogo. Maybe this distribution is something that makes a certain Bantu language a language on its own and not a variant of dialect of the other language because like this are like in Swahili this is present tense in Isanzu it's past so in Chigogo based on on tone it can be recent past or remote past or narrative past so you see the same morpheme on the surface can be used can be used to fulfill a different um, grammatical, uh, different grammatical functions. Thank you. I think those are all of the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. I would like to thank Stanislav again for his presentation and everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar on Wednesday, the 14th of December by Mauro Tosco and Bonnie Sands entitled Early East African and Peripheral East Cushitic 
foragers and pastoralists in early East Africa.